morning, and thank you for this fine invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I admit to you all right now that next year is the 50th year that I will be tasting coffee. In June, in June, in June of uh, 1965, I started my first job at General Foods, which is now part of Kraft, and uh, after a short time became a coffee taster and a coffee trainer, and um, it's been a fun ride. Uh, I'm glad that Rick brought up the idea of wine, because wine and coffee are two of the most complex products and really make uh, it difficult to evaluate, but in fact, then it becomes a challenge. There are a lot of easier things to do. I talked about we do sensory spectrum, so we in fact do things like smell garbage and diaper pails, and as gross as that sounds to you, it's easier than doing coffee. <laughs> it really is easier. So, um, you know, this, this is an obvious statement about how people view the world. I'm very interested in some of the previous speakers and talking about the context in which you look at things um, and how people uh, relate to products. Rick's comment about knowing that the wine was more expensive and in a really beautiful restaurant with really beautiful glasses, the wine truly will taste better. Sensory evaluation, uh, historically and, and very often in, in, uh, associated with both wine and coffee and tea and some other commodity type products has been thought of as something where you have three people standing around the bench saying, oh, I don't know, this one tastes pretty good. Um, but in fact, it is, um, and, and Helene is, is from UC Davis, in, starting with UC Davis in the 60s, sensory has become a science, a scientific discipline in which we are very, very interested in um, evoking, measuring, analyzing, and interpreting human responses through what we traditionally call the five senses, and depending on who you talk to, there may be more. This is a very, very important concept here. That is, you can have a stimulus and you can have many, many responses. And what we fail to sometimes think about is the reason that people have different responses isn't because it's so subjective, but in fact the way that people process these things through their brains. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the difference between a highly trained person and, a, and an average consumer. And that's basically what a lot of us are interested in, linking product understanding from experts with consumer understanding. And we'll be working on that so that we better understand this equation. This equation is what most sensory scientists work on. On the one side, you have product understanding that is all about the attributes, how you describe the product, the experts, the Q graders, uh, the research sensory scientists describe the products. Those uh, attributes are then filtered through the consumer's screen of expectation. Uh, Emma mentioned it, some of the previous sp um, speakers mentioned it. In that filtration, those attributes then come through and the consumer decides whether or not they like or dislike those products. And you can get very, very different responses if that screen of expectation, which sometimes is called the concept, does not align with the product. And so selling coffee better means setting up that expectation in the coffee shop, on the label of the brand, so that that consumer knows what's going to be in that cup of coffee before he or she drinks it. We use this very, very sophisticated descriptive tool in order to identify what, in fact, are the attributes that are in coffee or anything else. Now, I was very fortunate to be invited to the World Coffee Research uh, Program that was held in Kansas City a few weeks ago, and we're working on research panels. And we're looking, uh, we had about 
over 20 different experts from across the industry, and we were having discussions about what's needed for research, what are we going to do in order to be able to identify the proper varietals that will be the next generation of coffee plants to survive the, the disasters that Rick didn't really describe, he said, about um, uh, all types of problems with the environment and with pests, how can we find the very, very best plants to resist those things? Well, we're going to work on that. And there are different types of lexicons. Most of you are very familiar with Q-grading. That's a quality lexicon. There are also marketing lexicons. And Tracy talked a little bit about how you market your products to people and you, com you communicate with consumers. Consumers use a, a, sometimes a completely different language and sometimes much to your detriment, you teach them a certain language and then they feed it back to you and they may or may not get it right. My favorite one is consumers will always tell you that the coffee they love is not bitter and the coffee they hate is bitter. It's because you told them bitter is not a good thing. And so they feed it back to you as a good, bad thing sometimes. And so you have to watch that in the confusion between the marketing and the consumer. What we're working on is a research lexicon, a very re detailed lexicon to describe the specific attributes of coffee varietals and coffee's um, processing. And I'm going to share a few of those words with you, and um, we're going to be working on helping develop the research lexicon that's going to take place um, at Kansas State to do the research. And the new coffee research lexicon and the panel will be uh, a more objective tool, more like an instrument. It's going to actually be related to, um, uh, correlated with um, instrumental measurements and allow for rapid screening of varietals to speed and confirm uh, research outcomes. And hopefully it will also foster communication between coffee uh, researchers around the world, uh, suppliers, re um, retailers, and so forth, so everyone will sort of be on the same page. We're going to have a standard lexicon. Each attribute will be defined and referenced with an example, and then we'll have a calibrated intensity scale. And if you go to the um, coffee experience room, you can see a couple of examples of those so that you can see what it looks like. We actually try to calibrate, and we do a good job of it, um, calibrate um, people like we calibrate instruments. So I'm going to jump from there, and I'll be happy to talk to you, and, and my colleague Edgar Chambers and Dolores Chambers are here. Uh, if you want to talk about the World Coffee Research Project, we'll be happy to talk about that. But I want to talk about a little bit about how we use sensory science and, and take it a little step further. So this is research that we've done with expert panels and with consumer groups and putting them together to talk about different pairings. Now there's a long history and many, many chefs talk about pairings particularly of wine and food. So I volunteered to be on Rick's tasting of the Puyat <laughs> wine. I, I think he should have a sensory scientist really at the table. I will be happy to travel wherever it is. There is a long history, and I will have to tell you, some chefs are very good at doing this, and some chefs are not so good at it because they always talk about the tastes. Thank you, Emma, for talking about the flavor. And they sometimes miss out on talking about the flavor pairings. And so I got into a huge brouhaha with a sensory colleague of mine who was horrified by this research that came out recently about whether or not you can relate things chemically. Now, what we do know is that you can relate them from a flavor standpoint. You can absolutely relate them, and this research is brilliant. I mean, it looks like a subway map, but it's actually quite wonderful. Uh, and it helps to explain which things go which, with what other things. When I presented some of this research in a little bit more expanded form recently at a conference in Rio, 
I had a chemist come up to me right after the talk and say, I am trying to do this with chemistry and my data is terrible. So chemically, it's not so easy to do, but from a flavor standpoint, it is. And we, we think some of it is overlapping compounds, but we think that a lot of it has to do with things going sort of together. So my friend Edgar Chambers and I have been working on this idea of integrity and integrating attributes, where when you talk about a product, you have the attribute, you have the intensity, you may have an order of appearance of those attributes, like the finish of wine, and also how much time some of the, the flavor notes last. You then have things like how harmonious are they, how much balance is there, how much blend is there, and really, very importantly, how much authenticity or fidelity. Um, Edgar and I worked on a project tasting gelato in Florence. I know, feel sorry for me. Um, we could have been visiting David instead of tasting gelato, but we tasted gelato, and when you taste a gelato that says that it's fresh apple gelato, or no, fresh pear gelato, and it tastes like artificial Jolly Rancher apple, and eh, not so big on the authenticity part. So we're looking for this holistic integrity when we work on uh, products. This is how it works. When you cook and you have a tomato, tomato has skunky notes. And why you put garlic and onion with a tomato is because the skunky notes of the onion and tomato work with the skunkiness in the tomato, and together they produce less skunky flavor and more garlic, onion, and tomato. Similarly, the fruity notes go with the cheeses, and the green viney that's not so pretty in a tomato is very nicely dealt with with a little bit of basil and oregano. Similar with an apple. Apples are woody. They have apple flavor, but they have woody flavor. So what do you put with them? You put some vanilla and you put some um, cinnamon, and those things tend to go together and cover over the woodiness of the apple and make the pretty things show. There's a reason why there is no such thing as raw garlic ice cream. <laughs> oh, you think that's, now why? Why not? Because they don't go, because the dairy and the raw green garlic, not a good thing, okay? My favorite example is um, drinking whole milk with tuna salad. Okay. What happens is there's something about the dairy and the fat together that draws out the metallic, tinny flavor of the can from which the tuna came. And it goes, and it just brings right up that tinny flavor in your mouth, and you're like, this was not a good thing. So drink wine or beer with your tuna. <laughs> For the pairings, I'm going to show you two sets of data. One set of data is from a highly trained descriptive panel that really knows a lot about the attributes, and I'll show you a few of the, of the lexicons that they developed. And the other is a community narrative articulate consumer group. And this is just a description. I'll leave that in there. I'm not going to go through the entire. They're actually like a bridge between outside consumers and the experts. So we did some food pairings. We did wine, and we did coffee. And we did wine with chocolates, and we did coffees, two different coffees. And I knew somebody was going to ask me which coffees. I have to go and find them, so don't ask me. Uh, with different breakfast cake products. And so when we did the chocolate, here are some of the very simple descriptors that we came up with for the dark chocolate. And here are some of the descriptors, and please notice there's much more dairy characteristics and caramelized in the milk chocolate as opposed to the dark chocolate. And when we did the wines, here are some descriptors of the red wine, and here are some descriptors of the white wines. And so we taste the wine separately, we taste the chocolate separately, then we taste the chocolates and drink the wine with them. And what we found out was 
that changes occur when you do the pairings. The panel found that the combination of the dark chocolate with the red wine was a very highly balanced and blended experience, and it increased the woody, um, the, now this gray is the consumers. The consumers, this was the only pair in which the consumers disagreed with the train panel. Okay, so look at this bottom left. This is the only disagreement, and this disagreement over here, there was the, the, pan, the consumers just like the milk chocolate with the wine better because they thought it was sweet. And they didn't like the dark chocolate with the red wine because it was a little too astringent for them. The descriptive panel found the opposite. So here's what happened with the chocolate with the white wine. The consumers agreed with the trained panel that the dark chocolate with the white wine was not a very good idea. And they did, everybody agreed that the white wine with the milk chocolate which was a much better pair. Now we get to coffee. Here's what happened with the instant coffee. Please notice in the instant coffee there's meaty brothy notes and a lot of caramelized and a lot of cereal grain. And when we did the French roast coffee, it had more dark roast, whiny, nutty characteristics, skunky, rubbery, all a good thing. And then when we did the pastries, the coffee cake, here are some of the characteristics, a lot of molasses, buttery, brown spice. The cheese Danish had a lot of dairy, cultured dairy with some cinnamon. This was interesting. This was a product that we decided to throw in and it went with, with nothing. And I'll show you the results. What was interesting in any time you ate this with a, with a warm beverage, whether it was instant coffee, brewed coffee, or tea, it tasted like furniture polish, like pledge. So the dark, the, 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 the um, hot beverage just pushed up what we call the citral note, that sort of artificial lemon thing that was in there. So I'll show you what happened. When we did the instant coffee with the lemon and the cheese danish with the instant coffee, the instant coffee went better with the cheese danish, according to the experts. The experts did not think that the lemon donut, and I said it was not a very successful uh, entry, and our consumers agreed that the lemon donut was not so good, but the cheese danish paired with the instant coffee. A lot of it has to do with some of, that, the, some of the brown notes going together. When we did the French roast coffee with the pairings, here's some of the descriptors, and here's the results. Not a very good pairing. The lemon donut just wasn't going to make it. Um, whereas in the coffee cake, which has a lot of brown, chocolatey, uh, buttery notes, it went very, very nicely with the French roast coffee. And both the consumer group, which is the gray evaluation of a good pairing, and the high balance and blend from the trained tasters. And so the overview of this whole thing was that certain products do really, really well with others. And sometimes you can, as I is in my example of the apple and the tomato, you can almost guess. When I cook, I taste what I start with, whether it's the meat or the vegetables or whatever. And I can almost anticipate what is likely to go with that based on some of the flavor characteristics that are there. And so it becomes fairly obvious which things go well together. One of my thoughts is, as you think about selling coffee better, is wouldn't it be cool to have products in a coffee shop that in fact were appropriately paired with certain types of coffees or coffee beverages. 
it's not difficult to do. You just have to do a little trial and error so that you can recommend that this particular coffee or this particular tea would pair well with these cakes or with these snacks or even with these sandwiches. It, it's my belief that you can, you can anticipate those types of things. As I think about it, if you have an Italian, if you have a, a chicken breast with pesto on it in a sandwich, I can tell you that there are probably certain coffees that will go well with that and others not so well because of the green and the garlic that you have to be careful about, okay? And I will tell you whether or not the pine nuts that are in the pesto are roasted or not will matter, depending if you're going to pair it with a coffee. So think about some of those things as you start to create that experience that Sean talked about. The whole experiential piece is very, very important. How to create the context, the facility, the location, the, the smell. Okay, let me just say that if you go into a fast food restaurant and you open the vestibule door from the parking lot and the first thing that you smell is the deodorizer from the restrooms, it's not a good thing. That's not a good pairing <laughs> of that smell and your food. So I need for you to think, and, and I'll tell you that half of all of the fast food restaurants that you go into, for some reason, the exhaust from the restrooms ends up in the vestibule. And most people don't are not consciously aware of that, but it influences their likelihood of returning. And so I want you to think very much about this whole broad experience of the entire um, sensory experiential and sensory being the, the, the building, the smell of the building, and so forth. So what did we find out? We found out that consumers pretty much agreed with our descriptive panel on most of the pairings, that it's difficult to pair foods and beverages uh, generally unless you work at it. And some of the limitations of our research were we only had American consumers and American products, so I can't um, tell you about what might happen in Europe or um, Latin America. I'm not sure. Um, we had a limited consumer population. Uh, we didn't do appearance and texture attributes, and I happen to be a big texture fan. And we did no alignment with concept, which, we, which as I've said already, is a very important thing. So let's think about the whole experience of how we can take different foods and beverages, or foods and foods, and you're gonna have a chance to do something tomorrow. There's, there's a taste experience today, two of them that are different from tomorrow, but tomorrow you're going to have two different pairing experiences. One is going to be nuts, nut butters with chocolates and seeing what goes, and the other experience is going to be to look at what happens with a low-fat milk and a high-fat milk when paired with both vanilla extract, sort of a test model, and then with different coffees so that you can see what happens. Fat is very, very important. I know people are trying to control their fat, but fat becomes very, very important in the manifestation of the flavor characteristics. And I want you to go and taste the same vanilla extract in skim milk and then taste it in half and half. And people taste it for me all the time and they go, ooh, what's, what, what, what'd you do? Nothing. No, what'd you put in this one? It's the same. You cannot believe it's the same vanilla extract. It has a completely different flavor profile because the fat releases certain volatiles in a certain way, all right? And so I want you to have those experiences. And so our next steps are to move beyond cuisines and culinary and to bridge with sensory, to use innovation of product and concept development, to go across cultures, and to look at this, and I, I loved um, Sean's description of the fragrances 
um, with body parts, which is absolutely true. And the most interesting thing is in the last 10 years, so many fragrances have food descriptors. So go and look at them. They all talk about vanilla and fruit and those types of things are not just floral experiences. And how does this work for um, personal and home care? Are you aware that most products that are supposed to be soft on the inside, like diapers and feminine protection products, their packaging now is suede and non-crinkly? That's not just a random thing. Those are de deliberate. How do you build a product that has the sensory properties cued on the outside or in your cafe that in fact says what the experience is going to be for that individual consumer? That's the drive um, for, for the research um, for the next several years for, as far as we're concerned. So, Please go to the sensory experiences and um, learn some of what us crazy sensory scientists do for a living, and um, we will see you there. Thank you.